today we are um, discussing the engineer report with Mr. Greg Basso. Greg Basso is a native of West Virginia and graduated in 1980 at the West Virginia Institute of Technology in the field of civil engineering and has over 34 years of experience as a registered professional engineer. He was chosen to lead Forensic Consulting Group as the president and principal engineer. He has provided forensic engineering services for nearly 20 years, serving in thousands of cases, ranging from claims of damage by blasting, construction defects, landslides, flooding, and stormwater, to claims regarding <clears throat> premise liability, employer's liability, design professional negligence, and fire damage liability. His clients have included individuals and property owners, insurers, and attorneys. Greg grew up with a background in construction and for a time operated the family's general construction business in Somerville, West Virginia. He serves in his church as a deacon and his community and his community as a firefighter and chaplain of the volunteer fire department. He is a leader in all aspects and is thankful to have served his state as a West Virginia Senator elected from the 11th District. Please welcome Greg Basso. Thank you, Julie. Good to be with you folks today. Um, I uh, will go ahead and share my screen. Um, you know, Julie, we've got everything mu muted and uh, I'm afraid that everybody might laugh at the opening slide, um, you know. Uh, we're going to talk today a little bit about the meaning behind the madness and understanding uh, the meaning behind each section of the engineer's report. Uh, we're going to go through and talk. Uh, I told Julie that um, if you have questions along the way, if you would throw up a hand or throw her a, a message and uh, we'll try to entertain those questions as you go along. Certainly we want to answer as many questions as possible and uh, be available to you to to be a resource as you understand how to read and understand a civil engineer or a forensic engineer's report. And this may not necessarily apply just to an engineer. Uh, engineer's report, I'm gonna talk about it from an engineering perspective, but this would certainly uh, also apply to what other experts uh, would be presenting uh, in the form of a report. I want to say thank you today for you uh, for attending today's seminar uh, or webinar. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. I want to say thank you as well to CNC uh, for the chance to be able to speak and to present. <clears throat> Let's uh, talk a little bit about what we want to try to achieve today. Uh, just a few objectives that I hope you come out of uh, today's webinar with is an understanding of the engineer's process as we go through and prepare uh, an engineer's report. Understand the legal process driving the report development. Uh, recognize the differences in the report sections and why they're set up as they are. And more importantly, uh, beyond all else, know that the conclusions don't tell all. Uh, so often people have a tendency to go to the conclusions, read the conclusions and fail to understand what is the meat behind uh, why the expert has arrived at the conclusions he or she has as they've gone through and prepared the expert report. As we all know, uh, insurance is the driving force uh, behind many of the claims uh, that arise. Insurance is a legally binding contract and it's a policy where an individual or organization, the insured, uh, pays consideration and receives their financial protection for a loss for a specific risk. Now, we all know that that may be property damage, it may be a fire loss, it may be flooding. Uh, certainly, it could be the loss of personal property or a vehicle. Uh, those are the types of risks that insurers are asked to cover. Uh, from time to time, and, and obviously, uh, sometimes it goes uh, when you when you get called to to uh, show up for that that golf outing, and uh, somebody has ensured whether or not somebody will get that one and hole in one on the day. Uh, and obviously, when we go through 
uh, the insuring process, if there's a financial loss, they're seeking to be covered for that particular loss. And that loss is covered uh, uh, and provided uh, by an insurer or the insurance company. So out of that, as we go through on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, when there are problems associated with a particular piece of property, and I'm, for the most part, I'm gonna talk from a property perspective, but I don't want you to, un I don't want you to think that I'm limiting it to that. Um, there's other losses as well, such as uh, design professional negligence, uh, which I serve in in a variety of cases, that we may not be looking at a physical piece of property, but rather what we're looking at are um, design documents that represented what the construction might, re might be. Uh, and there's other issues as well. So the insurance claim uh, occurs when the insured has a problem and they make a request to an insurance company uh, relating to the accident, illness, damage to the property and the like. Uh, and that uh, insurance claim is a document or request that the policyholder files with the insurance company seeking rest restitution. They wanna seek recovery uh, for their particular loss. <clears throat> Obviously, it may impact uh, flooding. It may revolve around flooding. And that was riverine flooding. It may be indoor conditions that you may have. For instance, uh, on the right-hand side is a door closure. And because it was not properly maintained, the door slammed shut on a gentleman's foot, causing injury. And uh, we generated a, a forensic investigation report out of that particular claim. Or it could be a slip, such as on a, on a slick tile uh, surface in a mercantile establishment, such as you see on the left. All of these various uh, types of uh, claims may arise from various types of events or occurrences that happen to an individual. So when the call comes and the questions begin, uh, adjusters are faced with a, a, a myriad of questions. Is the floor too slick? Uh, is the why is the foundation cracked? What did cause the flooding at the property? Uh, was it natural or was there something occurring on somebody else's property that triggered flooding that uh, occurred on my property? Uh, what caused the fire? Uh, was it a, a, a leaking gas manifold? Uh, or was it uh, an employee's action that caused and triggered a, a fire, say for instance, in a commercial establishment? Could the car hitting the front corner of the building cause a crack that's occurring in the drywall on the other end of the, end of the building? And there's so many of those types of things. So as a result of that, uh, you're going to be wondering, how do I get a clear understanding about what's happening in these particular situations. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a forensic investigation. Well, look, first let's understand what forensic means. Uh, forensic is derived from the Latin forensis, uh, from the public, uh, or forensic from the form. Uh, this is what occurred in, in the Roman times, uh, where situations where people gathered in order to hear uh, various situations uh, we see it now in the courts. What we do is we apply scientific knowledge to legal problems that are occurring in everyday life. And, um, and because it belongs to the courts, uh, we think of it from a forensic perspective. Forensic does not necessarily mean that it's an engineer. Uh, it does not have to be a chemist. Uh, you may have forensic accountants that are dealing with numbers. Uh, all of these are individuals who from time to time are called in and asked to opine about particular issues within uh, the, a particular situation. And a report will be generated out of that. So let's talk about it from a forensic engineer's perspective. Uh, and, and because I am an engineer and many of the cases that we have uh, and are presented with deal with engineering, Let's understand that engineers, as practitioners of engineering, are professionals who in, invent, design, analyze, build, and test machines and complex systems, which means that we're doing the design stuff on the front end before it's constructed or built. But once it breaks, 
uh, we use the science, technology, and math to solve uh, the problems that are facing us in a particular situation. And they're facing people in everyday life. So what we do is we take those, those scientific methods uh, and the applications that have been developed over the years, and we put them into the science or into the practice of forensic engineering, where we apply those engineering methods to find the cause of damage and failure of, of equipment and or structures. And that comes out of the law dictionary. The application of the art and science of engineering and matters which are in or may possibly relate to the jurisprudence system, inclusive of alternate dispute resolution. Excuse me, just a second. <clears throat> it is uh, springtime in West Virginia and the pollen is running. The buds are blooming, and my sinuses are giving me fits, and I apologize for that early. But the forensic engineering comes out of that. Uh, so what does a forensic engineer do? Well, we began analyzing the cause of damage and failures, and we take the science and the engineering methods that have been developed in times past in the, and, and, and utilized in the practice of designing and developing the particular Thing that we're looking at. It may be a house, it may be a component uh, that caused a fire. Those engineering methods are applied all the time in, in figuring out what went wrong. They may involve systems, structures, components, or materials. Obviously, they're going to involve people in various fashions or forms. Uh, they will uh, help discern facts related to the damage or failure, and we get to opine regarding the subject matter. But the forensic engineer ultimately is an educator of the courts and those particip participating in the legal process. What do I mean by that? Well, because you're doing insurance and it's a legal contract, there is a process that we're following to make sure that we stay out of the court system. Uh, and so that's why we as forensic engineers practice in a certain way, why you as adjusters Practice in the way that you do. Uh, you're going out, you're doing an evaluation, you're making a determination on a particular claim and figuring out that maybe you don't have all the answers. All the cards are not on the table for you to be able to make an appropriate decision and you need a little help understanding. This is where the forensic expert or the forensic engineer comes into play and helps you to understand those parts and pieces. The forensic engineer is an expert in the subject matter. Now, why do I say it in that particular form? Again, we're talking about legal uh, process in this particular matter. I want you to understand a little bit about where we as forensic experts come from. Uh, we are in that legal process. And so we have to understand that because we're in that legal process, uh, our opinions and testimony will ultimately be entered as evidence uh, within the legal process. So here is rule 702 that comes out of the um, rules of evidence that are the federal rules of evidence. Many states have adopted these as well. So if a case, for instance, that you're working on ends up in, in a uh, state court, uh, then similar rules will likely apply. These may vary just a little bit. But the witness is, is qualified as an expert by knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education, and may testify in the form of an opinion or otherwise if the expert's scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge will help the trier of fact, and that's going to be the judge, and that's going to be the jury, to understand the evidence and to determine a matter in the issue. And obviously, we're going to be working with attorneys. We need to be able to explain to them what is going on with a particular issue so that they can either establish a position for, for um, a, plaint, a complaint on, on the matter or to establish a defense against a particular complaint that has arisen. Understand that forensic experts are not for one side or the other. We may be paid by one side or the other, but we are there to be unbiased objective, 
individuals who evaluate the processes and be able to educate everyone on the um, on the issues at hand. Uh, and and as part of that process, you're at the beginning stage of this legal process. And so what determinations you make may ultimately give rise to a claim that occurs down the road, uh, that occurs in, fe in, in either federal or state court that we would then be assisting in understanding uh, the issues at hand. The testimony is based on sufficient facts or data. The testimony is the product of reliable principles and methods. And the expert has reliably applied the principles and methods to the facts of the case. So why do we say it that way? Well, because when we get to civil procedure, uh, what we have to understand is our, our report and our testimony will eventually come into the court uh, should it ever arise, give rise and get to that particular stage. At the initial stages of, a, of a, an insurance claim, typically we're not going to be talking about that, but we have to establish all of the evidence initially because if it gets to that stage, it will be entered as a, a part of the record of the courts. Rule 26 of the Rules of Civil Procedure, uh, in general, talk about the addition to disclosures required by 26A. Uh, what they're talking about is experts being able to provide uh, uh, assistance to the courts and witnesses who must provide a written report, unless otherwise stipulated or ordered by the court, must be accompanied by a written report. Well, we're giving you a written report when you ask for it. Uh, to help you understand the issues at hand. It provides a complete statement of all the opinions that we hold as experts. It provides the facts or data considered by, the, uh, by us uh, when we're forming them. Any exhibits uh, that may be supporting uh, the conclusions that we arise uh, or arrive at through the course of, of our reporting, evaluation and reporting process. And it also has to present our qualifications in order to, to present before the court. We have to list any publications that we've done, for instance, uh, in the previous 10 years. All of this establishes a basis of our qualifications to be able to assist you and to assist the courts through this legal proceeding. It provides a statement of the compensation, how much we're going to, how much we've charged you all, as well as how much we will charge going forward, uh, should that be entered in, into uh, the case. So let's talk a little bit about what the forensic engineering report might look like. But I want you to understand there is a standard that we operate under. Um, it's an ASTM standard. It's E3176. It was most re recently revised in 2020. But this particular standard has been out there for a number of years and gives a general outline that we'll discuss a little bit today. Most of the engineering or expert reports that you receive as a, a, um, an adjuster uh, should generally follow these guidelines. Now understand that uh, this outline is for, it can be compressed a little bit for short reports, brief reports. It may be expanded uh, when the litigation matter or the forensic matter that we're investigating it needs to be exhaustive. It needs to take a lot of time to lay out the details and not only that, lay out the evidence that we have before us and the analysis that we're provi uh, providing as part of that. This particular standard guide generally outlines our report. So what's inside? Uh, first, we wanna fig figure out how to identify how the report is gonna be for formatted and who it's for, where it occurs, the introduction, qualifications, incident description. This is a very brief uh, outline that we'll follow as we continue on through my presentation today. So identification. Identification lays out who's the writer or the author, uh, who commissioned the report. That could be your insurance company that you're serving commissioned the report from us uh, to be able to assist in the matter. It'll provide a short title, 
uh, it'll talk about the date of loss, loss of location, uh, and who the affected parties are. It'll provide the claim or case number. If it's in litigation, it'll provide the case caption or docket number uh, if it's been filed there. And obviously, it's going to uh, include our file reference number as well as uh, the report date. <clears throat> Within the introduction uh, of that report, uh, we'll introduce the assignment or the scope of service that we're providing to you uh, that, we've been a, that we've been assigned. Uh, we may ask some questions as part of the introduction. Uh, that, when we talk about the way we operate, especially if you get into fire investigations, we talk about the scientific method. Uh, that's laid out in NFPA 921. That scientific method, for instance, will ask us to present certain hypotheses regarding the particular issue at hand that we're working on. So those are the questions that we'll ask. It may, uh, the introduction may provide an early overview as to what the report looks like and whether or not uh, uh, there needs to be a brief outline of any conclusions uh, that are described. In a lengthy report, uh, this introduction may be tailored somewhat as an executive summary uh, to provide the introduction of those brief conclusions uh, that you would see towards the latter, in, latter reaches of the report. I will tell you that our reports have changed somewhat simply because um, some of the insurers that we work with have asked us to move the conclusions from the rear of the report to the front of the report. And we've accommodated that. A, a word of caution, however, don't stop at the conclusions. They'll give you enough to whet your interest, but you really need to go and dig in uh, to the back of the report, looking in the other aspects to really get the true meaning of what you're dealing with. So uh, as we look at the introduction, it could brief, include some uh, brief descriptions of the qualifications of, of myself as an expert or the other experts that are participating in the case and preparing the report. Um, those qualifications may be included in the appendix, but they'll give you some indications as to how good, um, what types of cases they've served in and, and how well they operate in that uh, forensic evaluation process. Some of the information that will be contained in that should include any testimony uh, that they have provided over the course of the last four years. Uh, I think the rules of, uh, of um, civil procedure uh, now talks either for four or five years. And so those will be the court, the court cases that will be included to, traditionally in a CV, uh, curriculum vitae, that lists all of the experts uh, qualifications. Uh, for lengthy reports, uh, it may, uh, you may have a specific section that expands on our qualifications. It states our levels of experience to serve, and it would provide any relevant licensure uh, particular, uh, pertaining to the particular matter at hand. <clears throat> the next section of the report will provide a, a brief description of the incident. <clears throat> Uh, it describes the incident. It provides a, a narration of the chronolo chronology uh, that occurred with the uh, presentation of the matter, and it may provide certain facts uh, that the expert is relying upon as they go through and do their analysis and prepare the uh, report for the particular matter that you're working with. Materials received will lay out any of the documents that the expert has relied upon. Uh, if it's a litigation matter, this would include any depositions, any disclosures that are made by the various parties in the matter. It would include the complaint, and those would all be uh, identified in this particular section. Uh, the materials reviewed in some of the smaller reports where it's an initial report where we're working traditionally for you may include uh, the research that we do regarding, uh, uh, for instance, if it's a precipitation event, uh, we would go back and look at NOAA records from the National Weather Service to understand what 
the precipitation event was and whether or not it corresponded with the date of loss in the particular matter at hand. It would include any statements or reports. So for instance, um, while you're out on the job site, uh, the uh, insured provides some information to you. That information needs to be passed on to the expert because we may find something there that we need to rely upon in, pre in uh, preparing and formulating our opinions as we present those in the report back to you. This would also cite any treatises and publications that we're relying on. Uh, for instance, uh, if we're relying upon a, a, a failure of a deck and we've relied upon a particular building code, we would go back and cite the applicable building code and sections and describe generally what the issues are uh, in relationship to the building code in this particular section. We're not going to form an opinion or we're not going to do an analysis at this particular location. We're just simply going to show the relationship between the two. The analysis will be done at a later time in the report. There will be those times where, say for instance, in a fire investigation, we need to provide certain experiments uh, to go out and to prepare an, uh, an experiment that would demonstrate an exemplar situation of the conditions that arose at the time that the fire may have uh, been at, at the point of origin and why it caused damage in a particular component. Uh, so what we would do is we would use these experiments performed to look and do any field testing or sampling, uh, particularly if you're going to be uh, a landslide, for an, uh, responding to a landslide, and we have materials that are exposed now, we want to collect samples of those soils and be able to have those analyzed to understand why the soil uh, and the slopes are performing in the fashion that they did. There will be laboratory testing that may be required when we gather those samples. We also may take evidence from the scene and bring that evidence back to the laboratory in order to take it apart or to test it in a laboratory setting to understand why the failure may have occurred. It may include destructive evaluation of, of samples or of evidence. We want to make sure that we go through the process of making sure all the parties uh, that need to be no notified as part of that destructive evaluation are told about that testing that's going to occur well before uh, the testing date so that they can be in attendance and everyone has the opportunity to review uh, and opine later on in their respective reports about what that test revealed. Traditionally, we'll try to utilize recognized standards and practices and distinguish between site evidence tested and any exemplars. Uh, the, the goal here is whenever there's any testing or evaluation done to the extent possible, we want to see that it's reproducible uh, by others in another lab setting uh, later should it be required. Then we're going to move into the analysis section of the report. And this is where we get into the nitty gritty. This is where the forensic expert sets down and starts pulling all of the details together. Presents his analysis based on the observations, based on the materials that he's examined, and any experiments that he's uh, conducted. Uh, it may uh, be based upon any other technical information that would be available. Certainly, it's going to rely upon uh, data that we've collected through uh, our investigations and our research. The analyses will provide technical explanation of why the incident occurred. Um, it will walk through the steps, and I like to, I liken it this way. Uh, my role as a forensic expert, as an educator of the court, is to help you understand what's going on. In order for you to get there, I need to be able to take and lay a cookie crumb trail down. Remember the old uh, uh, story about Hansel and Gretel? Well, we're going to lay breadcrumbs out so that you can follow 
the way to get to the conclusion or to understand all the parts and pieces. We want to lay a roadmap down so that the trier of fact, which would be a jury, uh, should it ever get to that point, understands all the parts and pieces. And so that's why we lay out within the analysis and we lay our report out in the format that we do. So where they're laying all of the steps down that you take step by step by step to arrive at the conclusion. You can, you can be uh, educated and brought to an understanding much like uh, we are helping you to uh, help others in the future understand. And, and that will go not only to the jurors, but it'll also go to the judge. Um, I was recently in trial about a year ago in a case in, uh, in Kentucky. And uh, it was a situation where there was a fire that arose and the judge asked me a couple of questions because he wanted to understand what I was relating uh, to the attorneys in the questioning of events and he didn't understand something. So obviously I need to help everybody understand uh, what's going on with a particular incident. Uh, our analysis will identify any contributing factors that, that arise that we may find as we're going through and doing evaluations, doing experiments, uh, reviewing data uh, that helps us to get to that point. And I put this in quotations, this comes out of that ASTM standard. It, it distinguishes between non-compliance with a code, standard, or ordinance, and the physical cause of an accident. So in other words, if there's codes or standards that uh, should have been applicable, uh, we should arrive at a conclusion about whether or not it did or did not cause, uh, the, the, the incident was caused by a particular component, a particular methodology that was utilized, contract, contractor failure, you know, sometimes we have flashings that leak and they didn't follow prescribed practices that are recommended by the roofing industry. Uh, to put in step flashing and counter flashing to make sure that water doesn't intrude into a particular property. These are the types of things that we would talk about uh, in this particular situation. Then we're going to present our findings. Uh, we're going to talk about why it may be combined and, and understand that the findings when we get into the smaller reports that traditionally will occur through a flood loss, um, through some of the smaller type claims, uh, a hurricane loss, hail damage. Traditionally, we may take these findings and combine these with the analyses, uh, just simply because it's simpler to, to blend those together. But certainly we want to know that the findings describe any discoveries we have made. Uh, they want to describe any comparisons that we've made between uh, the products that we were testing or evaluating and exemplars of that. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the findings want to talk about any determinations we have, any considerations or judgments that we may have arrived at as part of that process. <clears throat> if we get into a uh, lengthy report, we may have commentary uh, that we want to include within the report to help you and others understand in layman's terms, uh, the technical issues at hand. And this is where we traditionally talk about that in an exhaustive fashion if we're talking about a lengthy report. Um, the, uh, the issue is that we convey it in layperson's terms. And why do I say layperson's terms? Because when we get before a jury, you're gonna have housewives, you're gonna have truck drivers, you're gonna have barbers and beauticians, uh, you may be lucky to have a technical person sitting on that jury, but for the most part, you're going to have lay people who don't understand all of the issues sitting there. And so it's important that we relate as much as we can in layman terms how the issue occurred uh, and help them to understand. In, in highly complex matters, this particular section of a report is very, very critical uh, so that you can get a clear understanding. And uh, so if you look at the conclusions and you're not sure about them, what you'll do is you'll come back to the commentary and see if there's anything within the commentary that helps you to understand. Certainly if you get, as an adjuster, a report and there's 
things that you don't understand when you're reading through that. Now would be the time to go back to the uh, the expert and ask them to opine or to expand upon a particular issue or to better explain what is happening uh, if it's a cause of damage and when you're looking at the analysis and they present the conclusions and you you start comparing between the two and they don't add up you need to be asking questions uh, so that you clearly understand before you begin giving your opinion uh, as to what the cost of repair uh, might be on a particular matter or how to resolve or adjust uh, other issues that, uh, that, are, that you're faced with. Finally, there are the uh, conclusions or professional opinions uh, that are included within the report. Um, this is where people typically go to. It can be explosive, and that's why I put this little slide in as I did, uh, because it may reveal and, and have an opinion there uh, for some that may not be very desirable. Understand that as experts, our role is not to present the Uh, the matter for one side or another. Our, our objective is to present the facts and help others understand what's, what's occurring and opine about what is occurring in a particular situation. I will tell you, as I'm sure that you have already learned in times past, that um, uh, experts will have differing opinions on matters, and we'll just leave it at that. Um, but Obviously, the conclusions or professional opinions of your experts should, should answer the questions that might be presented early in the report in the introduction stage. Uh, it should respond to the issues stated within the introduction, what you need to know in order for you to do your job. Uh, the conclusions should be unambiguous. Uh, they should be as definite to the extent practicable. Um, and obviously, uh, the conclusions will lay out various elements. Um, beyond the conclusions or professional opinions, when we get into some of the larger matters, uh, there may be rec recommendations requested. And I didn't put those into this particular slide series. I missed it. I apologize. But uh, following the conclusions, there would be recommendations that the expert might present. Uh, for repair of a particular structure, for instance, that you're looking at that is the subject matter. How do you put the deck back on it? How do you stop the water intrusion through, uh, th that's occurring at the roof level? Those would be things that an expert might be providing you some recommendations. Oftentimes, though, if you're asking us to provide a specific conclusion or professional opinion, you may not get those recommendations unless you ask for it. Uh, so if you if you think you want those, ask for them early on, uh, because it does take an expert additional time to go back and pull those recommendations together. If they know that they need to pull them together early on, while they're pu putting together their analyses and their and their opinions, they can put that list together and formulate that and quickly insert that as the recommendations uh, for you to be able to operate from. One of the last things that you'll find within the report is an appendix, and it'll include the supporting tables, documentations, and calculations uh, that the expert has relied upon in the presentation of his report. It may include his curriculum vitae if it's a, if it's a lengthy document that's included within the report. Um, usually that will be included as an appendix. It may include the photographs. Um, our reports uh, do that. When we do our photographs, we do them early on so that our observations and our photographs are side by side so that you can understand as you're reading through our observations, you can have the photograph right there and understand exactly what you're working with. Uh, and finally, it may have uh, similar supporting information or data related to the, to the presentation of the report. One of the things that you understand uh, about forensic engineers is that if we're practicing in most states, the engineer's report needs to be signed and sealed. 
there will be those states where we cannot provide a, a report that has an electronic signature and seal. We have to provide that what we call wet sealing a report. There's only a limited number of states that require that currently, uh, but there are those and we have to follow that particular practice. So what we'll do is we'll wet seal that report and then we'll be mailing that report to the uh, provider as well. We'll traditionally, and if you would like for it to be provided to you, we'll scan that report and provide it to you uh, so that you have it at hand. Uh, but the but but the original report will be the uh, document of record uh, that is the instrument of service that the the engineer or the expert has prepared as part of the forensic evaluation process. So I've gone real fast and I've covered a lot of things. Uh, so I'll, we'll open it up for questions. I'll welcome any questions that you might have. Uh, Julie's sitting there. Okay, I know Craig wants to ask a question, but does anyone else have a question they'd like to ask? Um, if you do, you can just unmute and ask Craig yourself if you'd like. We'll welcome that. I'll give you just a second. And Wendy has to. Go ahead, Wendy. Okay. Hi, Greg. How are you? Good afternoon, Miss Wendy. I'm well. Thank you. Um, enjoy the presentation. I just wanted to touch on a couple of topics that you mentioned. Um, one is repair methodology. Um, I know that in some cases, you know, we have a, a fairly, especially in flood, we have a fairly straightforward issue of damaged pilings or perhaps repair replacement of a slab. But I have ha had claims where something like a beachfront property in Massachusetts where the retaining wall is part of the foundation and the repair can be extremely complex. If we wanted to have the engineer not only weigh in on the cause of the damage or the extent to which flood or other problems, you know, contributed to the demise of the foundation, how would we ask you and how extensive a re response can you give us regarding repair methodology? In other words, would you go as far as write an estimate or could you give us a detailed line by line scope and, and then differentiate, you know, between um, what's necessary and then what might result from that? I'm, I'm getting off track, but you see what I'm saying. I, I do. I, I, I understand exactly what you're, what you're getting at. And what we do, uh, it, it, we would need to know early on <clears throat> what, if you're going to want that repair methodology, because not only are we going to evaluate the damage, but what we may have to do is look at damages. We may need to look at accessibility. If we're at being asked to provide a repair methodology, there's a number of factors that we as engineers or experts would provide uh, in, in, in doing their, our analysis, particularly if we're going to have to step through that process. Um, it, repair methodology may require stabilization of a structure. And so we may look at the structure, find out where it's damaged, but we may be looking for low bearing walls, uh, central beams, uh, how those central beams may need to be stabilized in that repair methodology. Asking for that after we leave the site becomes, could become problematic. And if you ask for it, certainly we'd be glad to provide it, but it may mean that we have to go back and do a second trip, a follow-up visit. That's costly. And the insurer would like for us to be able to address that early on. Mm -hmm. But if you're asking for those repair methodologies to be provided, there is a little additional time and uh, preparation of that of, of that within our report process. Depending upon the case, it could be very simple. Uh, you know, a five, six line bullet point type list that we give you, we could give you on what's going to mm -hmm. be needed. Let's say, for instance, it's a water intrusion on a roof. We're going to indicate that you're going to have to you're going to have to take off the roofing. You're going to have to take off siding. You're going to have to expose the the flashing condition. You're going to have to assure that the, uh, or you're going to have to replace the step flashing and make sure that it's interlaced beneath the shingles against the wall. You're going to have to go back and put in a new counter flashing, replace the siding, and replace the the, the roofing material. Okay. That, for instance, is a bullet point list that can be done fairly easily. But if you get into a situation like, for instance, on a Jer on a Jersey Shore, and um, uh, the the flooding has impacted not 
only the structure, but the structure that's bearing on a retaining wall uh, that has been damaged uh, due to scour, then that repair methodology is going to be much more extensive. And um, I, I can't tell you, as I said here, what that mm -hmm. time may be. Um, no, I wouldn't expect you to. I mean, right. I understand. But sure. if we wanted that information, we need to ask for it as early as possible. And obviously, we might need to get you to give us a cost estimate because obviously we need to get that cost approved by our carrier. So you would be able to do that if we if we asked you for it. Yeah, and what you may do is you may leave it with the, uh, you know, obviously the adjusters are going to be going out and we're going to be working our opinion of cost uh, to provide our service based on what the adjusters uh, obtain as far as photographs and information while they're in the field. Sure. This is a good time to, you know, everybody says, well, get a few photographs and, and then we'll turn it over to the engineer. If you're initially out there in the field and you're doing those evaluations, more is better. Uh, when it comes to those photographs. And if you can provide those photographs to us in native form, yes, I want the adjuster's report that, that has many of those photographs, but if there's additional photographs that they took that would help us understand or that we could use and relate in preparing our opinion of cost uh, for providing our services, certainly those would be very, very helpful. Uh, and, and just indicating that not necessarily providing them initially, but m making available to us uh, should we need them, and we can always ask for them. But uh, as much information as we as we can have early on uh, helps us to arrive at a much more uh, efficient methodology and 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 cost uh, for our fees in in providing those services to you and to the insurers. Great. I appreciate that that feedback. Um, Certainly. And one more thing, I think it's just uh, as much a comment for the audience. You said that at times people will consider some of your conclusions to be undesirable. I'm sure that's been fun at times, but I think for us as adjusters, it's important to remember that there's no such thing as an undesirable conclusion. We just need an accurate conclusion because if we're able to find coverage, we want that to be well supported. But if we're unable to offer coverage, then obviously we have to live within the boundaries of the policy. So we shouldn't be looking for an outcome one way or the other. We just want the information to adjust the claim accurately. That's a great point. And I do too much litigation support. Um, well, let me so rephrase, I, I do a lot of litigation support. And so when uh, I pick up the phone and I, I, I've arrived at a, a, an undesirable conclusion, where I'm sitting in the car and I'm sitting beside the attorney and I'm going to look at him and say, you need to pay the folks. Uh, <clears throat> you know, those are undesirable and they, and they look at me with, you know, deer in the headlight stare. Uh, but you're exactly right, Wendy, when it comes to what you all are doing, you just need credible information upon which to, to base an opinion, mm -hmm. good or bad. And, and, and if it's, if it means that, uh, there are issues there that are covered under the under the policy. Certainly, you want to know that, and you want to know as much detail as you can, uh, so that you can provide a reasonable settlement uh, in in response to that claim. Yeah, exactly. Especially when it comes to federal flood insurance, we have an obligation oh, as adjusters to find <laughs> coverage wherever it's available and can be documented. So I don't think that an attorney in our situation at least, should consider a finding of coverage to be an undesirable issue. That's, that is our charge of duty under, you know, as, as federal flood adjusters. So thank you. Anyway, just, uh, just wanted to give that feedback. And I appreciate thanks, for, thanks for clarifying that. I appreciate that. No problem. Thank you again. I don't have any other questions. Okay, Greg. Um, Craig actually has a question and I'm going to turn it over to him for the rest of the time. Thank you very much for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Uh, Good hey, afternoon, Greg. Mr. Fowler. How are you? Good to see you. I'm Good doing to well. Too. So kind of segue in from what Wendy was discussing. Um, just a question I have, you know, in some situations, we may have a loss where, as you, as you pointed out, there was, an, uh, there was another engineer out there. There was another expert who had a different opinion. And in some cases, you know, we may have a wind versus flood loss. You know, the property's gone. We have some wind damage. We have some flood damage. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, if we, as you're building your reports, you're using science and facts and things like that. 
But when you get into a situation where there is a difference between what both engineers are saying, um, how do y'all reconcile that? How do you go about reconciling some situation like that if you're even asked to? Because I know in some cases where it's just whatever the engineer report states for that particular company, that's what they go by. They, they just disregard the other engineer report. But when you look at the other engineer report, it, it does seem to make some sense or some facts in there. But and you get in those situations, how do y'all go about, how do you reconcile those if you, if you are in that situation? And, and that's a great question. And that's a, and that's a tough question. Um, I, I'll be honest with you. Uh, within the litigation support arena, obviously opinions are varying every time we get into those things. But when we get into a flood loss, uh, I've not had a challenge to be able to sit down and do that, that determination of figuring that piece out. But let me offer this. Um, timing of the site visit may make a differentiation between what I would opine on a particular situation versus what the other expert may have. The other expert, for instance, may have been in there the day following the loss. I may be there three days following the loss or four days. And so the conditions may have changed naturally because wind continued, flooding continued, uh, you know, or, or flooding recurred sure. over a particular situation and, and had an impact on what occurred between what he says and what I said. We traditionally wouldn't know that until you make a determination and, and file that and the other insurer, for instance, would make that determination, the other expert serving the other insurer. And, and at some point, somebody's going to get those two reports and they're going to sit down and they're going to say, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. There's a problem here. And, and, and based on that, what we have to do is we have to take and look at that information. I will tell you that I have changed my opinions before and that's my responsibility. You know, mm -hmm. if, if, if I have to have uh, additional information that gives rise for me to further evaluate the case, and to change my opinion, one, I have to acknowledge the, the information that's provided to me. Number two, I need to do an appropriate evaluation and, and determine what steps were different in the evaluation I'm just now performing versus what occurred in the past. And thirdly, why the opinions are different now as compared to then. And, you know, if he got there the day after the loss and I'm there three days after the loss and the conditions changed, but he provides later on the photographs and all of a sudden the tree's not where it was when I got there, but rather it was, it was, it was a tree, you know, I'm looking at it from a flood perspective. He's looking at it from a wind perspective, yeah. but the wind, but the tree, but the tree is literally laying on the property. But as a result of the flooding, it washed the tree away. Okay, that would be a situation where I wouldn't have known that. Sure. And, and, and so that new evidence would give rise for me to make a change in my opinions. And, and certainly we as experts have an obligation uh, to present an unbiased opinion, an objective opinion on what's occurring at that particular piece of property. And, and, and from time to time, it may mean that we, we have to change our opinions. Okay, that's okay. That, that does. So that kind of leads to just a comment or, or a statement I'll make is, you know, in the importance of an adjuster being out there and in the field that the information they are obviously gathering, they, and, and it's, they're out there before an engineer's out there. So the information they're gathering, the documentation they're taking out there and getting that information in for a request for engineer early as possible is yes. a really a valuable part of what an engineering firm does, what you all do. Because right. obviously, I mean, you mentioned that before you're using, it's good to have our data and have our information out there. And I see, I see the point is that if the early, early we can get the information out there to back to into a report and back to say, Hey, here's what we're seeing. Here's what we need you to do. It helps in your case to be able to document that whole, how the whole process happened to begin with, um, how everything unfolded in a sense. So. Absolutely. The earlier we can get into a situation, ju just like you all, the earlier that we can get into a situation, uh, the, the earlier we're able to understand the facts. And, and more importantly, the, 
sooner we're able to take, if required, the possession of any evidence uh, that needs to be captured and, and preserved for others to review uh, or for further presentation to the courts down the road. Uh, we need to be able to do that as early as possible. Time is an enemy to us when it comes to the to evidence. Sure. And so we've got to be able to get get in fairly quickly uh, before before any of that is destroyed. Okay, excellent. Um, is if anybody uh, there's any more questions out there, Julie? Did anybody post any more questions in the chat box? No, sir. Okay. Well, Greg, um, thank you for your time. We greatly appreciate you getting on, spending the time with us today, um, and and for all the adjusters out there. Thank you for for as well participating. Um, I have a few announcements real quick before we end the call today. So some of you may not know this, but we actually <clears throat> record these. So if you hear at the beginning, we record these and we will go back, we'll edit some things. We'll take out everything that Greg said. No, I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll make some edits and things like that to them and, and trim <clears throat> down the time a little bit on some, you know, the intro and things like that. But we host these on our YouTube channel, our CNC uh, Claim Source YouTube channel, CNC Catastrophe YouTube channel. So if you ever get a chance that you want to just review something again and pick up maybe some information that you might have just overlooked or just wanted to hear, hear again, all of our Flood News at Noon series are posted on that channel. And if you ever have any questions beyond what you, if you review it again later on or you send the link to a friend or something and you have questions beyond that, you can always reach out to myself. Um, we can, we can then we'll reach out to our presenters and get that information as well and be able to get some answers back to you, back to y'all. So, so I just want to point that out there. Um, always can help enhance our processes and always going to help enhance and make us more efficient better adjusters to get us better, you know, more quality out there, more quality. And really ultimately what comes down to it, the customer experience that helps the policyholder understand that this product that they purchased is something worth value to them because we are giving them that customer experience and helping them in a situation, regardless if it's a CWAP or even a total loss, we're helping them understand the whole situation from beginning to end. And they feel, they feel the value of that. And so that's what we always do these training sessions for as well. And that's why we have uh, speakers on like Greg and, and everybody else that's been a part of this is that we want you to see the other perspectives from our, from the industry professionals out there like Greg who on the engineering side, we want you to see their perspectives on how can we make their jobs easier by getting the information they need, which ultimately comes back and helps us make our jobs easier as well, which ultimately gets down to, benefiting the policyholder and the, and the client. And that's the ultimate goal at the end. So um, again, I th just want to say thank you for, I know it's a, uh, it's, we ran over a little bit today, but thanks everybody for being on. Um, it's good to see everybody and we will see y'all again in two weeks. If y'all have any questions beyond this presentation, please feel free, feel, feel free to email me at any time. And y'all have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Be blessed. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, Greg.